Hi, I'm Chef Barbie. Like my previous jobs as president and an astronaut, chef is a job that little girls can aspire to but statistically are unlikely to reach. It's my job to cook. And this chef's hat I'm wearing shows it's a proper job in a professional kitchen. What do I like to eat? I'm Barbie, silly. I love to cook, but I don't eat because I'm a doll. And good dolls have such a nice figure and always check the calorie count and a moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips and getting a little chubby, aren't we? And I'm gonna be good and not have dessert and oh, don't take as much as your brother, he's a growing boy. And cooking is how we show we care about people. It's nurturing and provides sustenance for the whole family. A Barbie's place is in the kitchen. A Barbie plans and shops and chops and sautés and bakes and then a Barbie feels guilty about consuming the fruits of her labors. A Barbie serves everyone else's meals, and then a Barbie uses half of her plate for a salad. No dressing. A Barbie replaces lunch with a handful of almonds. Just before we dive in, it's not often that I get to shout out an amazing queer book by a friend of mine as part of a sponsorship, so thanks to Book of the Month for sponsoring this video, because it turns out Gwen and I are not in love by the wonderful Lex Croucher is in December's book selection. Book of the Month is a subscription service that helps you discover new and upcoming authors because the editorial team curates a selection of the best new books to choose from each month from a variety of genres. 80% of the books are from new and debut authors, so it's great for finding a future favourite writer. Then you can rate and review the books and take part in reading challenges right in their app with other readers. I chose Gwen and Art, which is one of my favourite books of the year, an absolute delight of a historical romp with a slew of amazing queer characters swoony romance and political intrigue in spades. I also got Tomb Sweeping by Alexandra Chang, a new short story collection that has wildly good reviews. You can choose from their selection each month and they'll deliver it right to you, either a new hardback or a recently launched audiobook instead, depending if you're a visual or audio reader. Using the subscription means that you'll be paying less for new release hardbacks, be able to join their loyalty program, and you can even add on extra books at a discount too. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, then visit the link in the description to pick a book and join today and you can get your first book for just $5 with a code SWEATER. The Starter, Consuming Food. Half hilarious, half traumatizing, there's been a rise of so-called Almond Mums skits and commentary on TikTok in the last year or so. Almond Mums are an apt description for a mothers who pass on obsessive food beliefs and behaviors onto their daughters in particular. An Almond Mum fixates on how much or little she and her daughter are eating, specifically praising weight loss and commenting with disapproval on weight gain, obsessing over the latest fad diets and suggesting almonds as a suitable meal replacement. The term originated from a 2013 episode of The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Gigi Hadid calls her mum to complain of feeling weak and only having eaten half an almond. Her mother Yolanda then replies, have a couple of almonds and chew them really well. In the years since, she has claimed not to remember even saying this, potentially having misheard her daughter. But at other points in the show, she called Gigi big and bulky, said she eats like a man, and on Gigi's birthday, she capitulates by allowing her daughter one night of being bad before letting her have a single bite of cake. There is a lot going on here, right? Not only the food and weight shaming, but also the choice of language and comparisons. It's not enough to insinuate that a big body is undesirable, it's also the connection to gender, that part of the undesirability is eating like a man. There's also this moralizing language, eating cake is bad, it's sinful. The TikTok trend of parodying this overbearing behavior started with creator Tyler Bender, who tapped into the specifics of that experience, quoting phrases that propelled many commenters back to their teenage years, asking, are you really hungry or just bored? Sing-songing a, a moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips, Nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. Fridges full of only low cal and skinny labeled options. For those who haven't grown up with that type of environment, that might seem exaggerated, but for many it's painfully relatable. It's easy to paint these women as the villains of the piece. Many undoubtedly had a huge negative effect on their daughter's self-image and relationship with food, but it's also important to look at the context of where their beliefs came from. They were postpartum in a time of heroin chic aesthetics and 90s speed diet pills after all. I think this is part of why people are talking about this again. The recent rise in the Y2K fashion and aesthetic has brought back these memories for many people. Fashion of that era was deeply rooted in fat phobia. Thin bodies themselves were what was considered fashionable. Low 
high-rise jeans were worn on red carpets, where a spectacular gown was rejected in place of a spectacularly skinny body shown off instead. A lot of millennials see the potential of this messaging repeating itself for a younger generation. Because those who experienced this almond mum phenomenon with their own mothers can see the impact that it had. We often talk about the influence of celebrities or magazines in terms of the body image issues of the 2000s, but this anecdotal trend reveals the pressures often began much closer to home. The TikTok skits themselves aren't meant to be funny, but you can see in the comment sections and the stitches the very real and lasting impact these pressures had. Users talking about the way their relationships to their own bodies and experiences of food, guilt and self-respect are still impacted by comments made by their mothers growing up, even today. In the mainstream reporting of this internet trend, many of the journalists covering the story reached out to experts from therapists to nutritionists, and they all seem to agree that being raised in diet culture, particularly in the home with parents engaged in restrictive eating, increased the likelihood of disordered patterns of eating in children into adulthood. One therapist, Jess Springle, who specializes in eating disorders, talked to Teen Vogue. She explained that it's not just attitudes towards food that are affected. You may struggle to understand your body's natural cues for food, rest, exercise, etc., and ultimately learn that your body isn't a trustworthy resource. Almond moms set their children up to be obsessed with food and their bodies in a way that are toxic and extremely harmful. The intergenerational effect of diet culture is shown across an overwhelming array of studies, including in situations where the parents themselves are unaware of their own negative self-talk. In the paper, The Intergenerational Transmission of Diet Culture, a Model of Children's Disordered Eating and Body Image, Dr. Ellen Jordan concluded, Notably, weight talk was found to significantly mediate the relationship between parents' diet culture beliefs and children's diet culture beliefs only in the child report model, suggesting that children's perceptions of parental weight talk may have a greater impact on the development of children's diet culture beliefs than parent reported weight talk. I wanted to look at how this ties into ideas around gender and food that these almond mums have absorbed from culture and social attitudes, particularly how these tie into the concept of the perfect body, a perfection that differs between men and women, because the almond mum's desperation isn't coming from nowhere, and I don't think that just the trends of the 2000s account for the prolonged and sustained attitudes to dieting and food morality and body image that we see today. When I started looking at this topic, I was led into it by this renewed discussion of almond mums and specifically the impact on women and girls, but I don't want to ignore the very real impact that gendered expectations of diet and body can have on men and boys too. In 2015, researchers at the nonprofit organization Common Sense Media compiled existing studies and information on the topic of diet culture and released a comprehensive review of research that was widely reported on. They found that one in four children has engaged in some sort of dieting behavior by age seven, and that 80% of 10 year old American girls have been on a diet. More than half of girls aged six to eight indicate that their ideal bodies are thinner than their current ones, but the same was true for approximately a third of boys. One study found that five to eight year old children's perceptions of their mother's body satisfaction predicted their own body dissatisfaction. Almond mums, it seems, don't just affect their daughters. I spoke to a creator friend of mine, Ellen from El Literacy, formerly Film for Towels on YouTube, about this almond mum trend. And she pointed out an interesting link to the conversations around and treatment of people making food content on the internet, particularly the vegan diet accounts of the 2010s. So I wanted to invite her on the channel and hand it over to her for this next section to talk a little bit about that. Thanks, Rowan. I would like to invite you all on a little trip down memory lane, back towards the golden age of social media, the late 2010s. Your Instagram feed is still in chronological order. The Snapchat dog filter is the accessory on Vogue. Twitter is still called Twitter. And an endless stream of vegan what I eat in a day videos are popping up on YouTube. Okay, that last one might've been a little unfamiliar to you, maybe a little bit more niche, if you weren't indoctrinated into the cult of vegan YouTube, but I certainly was. So hold my hand and I'll take you through the epic highs and lows of high school football. The 2010s were really the heyday of vegan YouTube, a community that had such a swift and dramatic rise and fall. Aesthetic videos of acai bowls and cauliflower wings influenced countless people to go vegan, myself included. Oh, I got that mouth. I'm vegan. <laughs> Bonnie Rebecca, Asino O'Neill, Raw Vanna, Raw Lyman, and of course, the one and only, Freely the Banana Girl. If you haven't heard of Freely, you best count your blessings. <laughs> These thin, conventionally attractive white women really ruled the vegan kingdom. They were the poster trials of the vegan community online. And What I Eat In A Day videos were by far the most popular on vegan YouTube. And 
not only were they, you know, vehicles for inspiration and showcasing how yummy and varied vegan food could be, they also became a tool to monitor and police and shame people's diets and bodies. Just to clarify, this whole analysis is a criticism of this section of vegan YouTube specifically, not vegans in general. So let's just get that out of the way. Veganism is a restrictive diet by nature because, you know, in its very essence, you are restricting what you can and cannot eat. And with veganism, you're cutting out a lot of kind of basic essential ingredients in a lot of dishes. And especially like 10 years ago, vegan options in you know supermarkets and shops and stuff were not nearly as mainstream as they are nowadays. So it was a lot harder back then. But vegan influencers took it a step further by promoting even more niche restrictive diets. Raw till four, raw vegan, high carb, low fat, no fat, no oil. And all of these diets were held up as like the way that you need to eat. There was no room for individual preferences or needs because all of these vegan influencers purported that the vegan diet in general or like especially whatever one they were following would make you lose weight it would clear up your skin it would cure any ailments and diseases all the while saving the earth and animals and the influencers both promoted and were held to very strict guidelines some of the control and restriction that we see in the vegan diets of this time were very reminiscent of disordered eating and eating disorders and one particular eating disorder called orthorexia which is the obsession with eating healthy food was something that was discussed a lot in relation to these circles and this is also interesting to consider because half of patients with anorexia nervosa who are admitted to um, eating disorder treatment have some sort of vegetarian diet so the vegetarian slash vegan diet can both mask an eating disorder or disordered eating or they can act as a gateway to like more and more restriction and eating disorders and disordered eating. And I think that this strictness, this monitoring, this perfection is also reminiscent of the kind of almond mom, mother, daughter dynamic that Rowan discussed. The What I Eat In A Day videos acted as a medium for both audiences and other YouTubers to monitor, police, and criticize other influencers' diets. They would give advice or input that was not asked for, telling them that they should eat more of X, less of Y, blah, blah, blah. And every single detail of their diet was dissected. Every ingredient of every food that they ate. This was mostly for the purpose of kind of seeing if something was completely ethical and vegan. And now there's one thing that's like flagging an ingredient to let someone know, hey, you know, this isn't vegan, whether or not you want to follow that. Or, you know, maybe giving advice if somebody asks for it. But it's hard to emphasize just how like militant and critical the vegan YouTube space was at this time. There was this just ceaseless monitoring, policing, shaming of people's diets and bodies. And the diets, the influencers were never good enough. They weren't vegan enough, not aesthetic enough. They were eating too little. They were eating too much. They were eating too little fat. They were eating too much fat. They weren't healthy enough. They were too healthy. The criticisms were never ending. It was a purity test built to fail. And it elevated a diet from a personal choice about health or food or whatever to this moral standard that if you didn't follow it perfectly, you would be subject to an onslaught of criticism. And nearly all of it was directed at women. As a culture, we are obsessed with people's diets, but there's a special kind of attention paid to women's diets, bodies, exercise regimes. Think of the amount of videos and articles you see about Victoria's Secret diets, K-pop idol diets, I ate like this person for a week, tabloid coverage of weight loss or weight gain. Vegan YouTube could have just been about sharing tasty recipes, but it absolutely wasn't. It became a space where thin, attractive women showed off their bodies while touting the merits of veganism. Some would explicitly say that going vegan makes you lose weight, while others would kind of imply it through visuals. The What I Eat In A Day thumbnails almost always had a picture of a thin white woman, either in a bikini, a crop top, a bra, showing off her lean toned body, all paired with pictures of her healthy vegan meals. So these images directly link the body to the food, saying that if you eat like this, then you will look like this, which is a really unhealthy and like, frankly unrealistic, in most cases, a message to send. They also set unattainable and unrealistic standards just down to the food that they were eating because not everyone has the time, the energy, and the money to make three meals a day from all organic ingredients using speciality, expensive 
powders or health supplements. And so many diets that we see online are performative. Whether it's a bodybuilder who eats 10,000 calories a day or a wellness girly who drinks matcha in her morning and has collagen shakes. Fit is not just something you eat or something that's a part of your culture. It is a part of your brand, your aesthetic, your worth. Images of our meals have become so loaded with cultural meaning, styled, curated, and posted to bolster your brand. And it's a part of the reason why seeing a skinny model eat like a fast food burger is such a popular like motif online because it's subverting expectations, but it's also saying like, yes, she can stay pretty and thin and beautiful while also like eating whatever she wants. Vegan YouTube is highly performative on an aesthetic level from these like carefully crafted Buddha bowls and acai bowls, but there was also another layer to the performance that came out as vegan YouTube kind of evolved or, you know, maybe nosedived. Vegan YouTube reached a tipping point where a lot of the people who were following all these like restrictive or healthy, whatever kind of vegan diets ended up going back to eating meat or fish or eggs for whatever reason. The Why I'm No Longer Vegan videos are really a social phenomenon for the history books. They had the same promise of drama as like breakup or apology videos and the same kind of somber tone, no makeup, sitting at the camera. Often the influencer reveals that they were scared of disappointing their audience or facing backlash and oh, did they face backlash. But because they were scared of this, they often revealed that they had given up a vegan diet either weeks or months ago, maybe even a year. They'd have been hiding their true diet from their audience, you know, continuing to perpetuate this like vegan lifestyle because it was part of their brand or the aesthetic. And this just really underscores like how performative the like vegan diet, vegan lifestyle was at this time. Even if the vegan influencers stopped being vegan for like health reasons, like for example, Bonnie Rebecca developed severe digestive issues, an autoimmune disease, depression, and acne while on a vegan diet. Other vegan YouTubers or, you know, commenters would react to their why I'm no longer vegan videos and basically say that like they didn't try hard enough, they don't really care about the animals, they never were fully, you know, vegan enough, they're making the whole movement look bad, they failed in some grand moral way. It's such a fascinating case study or like microcosm of, you know, a culture in general and like the standards that we hold women to because there's always always women in these videos, you know, policing their diets, their bodies, their ethics and like ballooning something as simple as what somebody eats in a day to hold such a grand, like cultural, personal, like political significance. And you know, if this woman fails at doing something perfectly, then she is just failure overall. And I think part of the like gender element is that, and as Rowan kind of will discuss in a little bit, masculinity and meat is so tied together. Whereas women in like the gender essentialist kind of view that we have are supposed to be more caring and nurturing, whether it's towards like a child or towards the earth. So then we assume that because some woman has failed and has gone back to eating meat or fish or eggs or whatever, that they don't have these intrinsic caring and nurturing traits that we're all supposed to have. And so they're like failing at being a woman in some greater sense. So when Rowan told me that she was making a video about gender and food, this was just like immediately where my mind went. But look at us. We survived vegan YouTube. All to discuss gender and food in such great detail. So let's, uh, let's get back to it. Take it away, Rowan. I think an interesting space where we can see the strength of social pressures around gendered bodies is in the seemingly strong prevalence of eating disorders in the trans community. Back in 2015, a survey of just over 289,000 American college students across 223 institutions was published in the Journal of Adolescent Health. Researchers were looking at the instances of self-reported eating disorder diagnosis and behaviors. They found that 15% of the 479 trans respondents reported eating disorder diagnosis within the last year. In comparison, the next highest demographic in the survey was cisgender queer women at 3.52%. Although the sample sizes for trans data are comparatively small, we see this same finding across a multitude of studies, that trans people seem disproportionately affected by disordered eating, whether diagnoses or self-reported. In 2022, for example, another American study, this time in the Annals of Epidemiology, carried out a similar survey and also compared the relationship between eating disorder behaviours and the respondents' gender and sexuality. They found that eating disorder risk, signified by clinically relevant eating disorder symptoms, was between 34 and 38.8% 
percent across different trans identities with the trans men and trans masculine students having higher rates of official diagnosis than trans women and trans feminine ones. Theories about this prevalence often twofold and connect to the wider knowledge around the causes and exacerbations of eating disorders. Control is a key component for many people who suffer with eating disorder symptoms, which may be triggered by a lack of control elsewhere in their lives, not necessarily connected to the literal ideas of food, weight and appearance. It's not hard to understand why trans people in the US, for example, might have heightened experiences of feeling a lack of control. But there is also the potential that pressures both internal and external for binary trans people to pass as their gender might have an effect too. If the world is reiterating that women should be small and dainty and delicate, especially when you're a trans woman living in a country with expensive healthcare or years long waiting lists for surgeries that you might want as part of your transition, would obsessive weight loss be something that feels like it could get closer to being seen as a woman or when the potential side effects of extreme weight loss include your periods stopping altogether might it have an appeal as a desperate option for trans men to eliminate elements of dysphoria particularly when it might also reduce evidence of so-called feminine figures like breast or hip fat one study in 2012 conducted by researcher monica algers found that the most frequent reason for eating disorders amongst their trans respondents was a drive to achieve a level of weight loss that would potentially suppress characteristics of the sex assigned at birth or to enhance characteristics of the gender identity the study, like most like it, had a small sample size, but is backed up by parallel studies on the effect of gender affirming treatment and care on instances of eating disorders in the trans community, where body dysmorphia, which is a core feature of the experiences of many eating disorders, was frequently lessened by the alleviation of gender dysphoria. There are pervasive myths around food consumption when it comes to gender, which no doubt affect our perceptions of what foods are normal or natural for men and women to consume and crave. For a long time, there is this ongoing idea of some innate biological hunter gap gatherer instinct where men are alpha fighters who spent thousands of years going off on hunts and bringing back meat for their communities while the women had a little look around the bushes and grab some berries or leaves or something. In all of these theories and discussions of food, sex and gender are very much equated as the same thing. So talking about it in this next section is going to be interesting. A lot of times I'm quoting things where they specifically use the terms male and female or man and woman interchangeably. So that's why that might be a little bit uh, mixed up and confusing for this next section because that is ultimately how it is talked about. This theory of human cultural evolution, however, has been slowly debunked over the years. Archaeological evidence such as the find in 2020, where nearly half of the set of 27 individuals were buried with hunting weapons were women, had researchers reluctant to conclude that these women were hunters, even though I imagine if they had all been men, it would have been a natural assumption to make for many. Scholar Randy Haas, who specializes in hunter-gatherer societies at the University of California, admitted, there is a sexist ideology in Western culture that may have slowed our ability to recognize females as hunters in the past. In 2022, an analysis of existing hunter-gatherer societies, as well as historical records and archaeological findings, led scientists to the conclusion that these gender divisions of food-based labor assumed to be accurate were, in fact, entirely false. They found women hunt in 80% of the societies looked at. In a third of these societies, women were found to hunt big game, animals heavier than 30 kilograms, as well as smaller animals. And specifically, these were hunts, rather than kills while gathering or game that wandered through the community. Dr. Cara Walsh-Scheffler at the University of Washington explained the wide reach of their analysis. We have nearly 150 years of ethnographic studies sampled. We have every continent and more than one culture from every continent. And so I feel like we did get a pretty good swathe of what people do around the world. Yeah, the attitude of meat being masculine, vegetables and produce being feminine is strangely ingrained in our society. So is there a biological reasoning behind differences in men and women's food consumption? If you give the topic a quick Google, you'll quickly find differences in calories recommended for men and women. Dig further into the reasoning and you get talk of fat versus muscle distribution and percentages, height and weight, patterns of hormones. And that all feels like it makes sense, but most sources vary in terms of what is recommended. The NHS recommends 2,500 calories a day for men and 2,000 for women. The Academy of Nutrition, on the other hand, is much broader, recommending women need 1,600 to 2,200 calories, while men need 2,000 to 3,200 calories per day. 
and both qualify this as on average. And when you push, it becomes clear that the recommendations are based on the idea of the average male and average female body. In fact, the reality of someone's specific needs is much more about individual elements of their body's makeup, which are broadly associated with their sex rather than specific to their sex itself. The nutrients based on sex are also interesting to dive into. Calcium is often listed for women, but the reasoning is actually for people going through the menopause. Similarly, folic acid is recommended in general to women, but is really only specifically useful for people who are looking to get pregnant. These are specific to life events and circumstances rather than universals for all diets. Iron-rich diets are said to be useful to stave off anemia for people who are menstruating, which ironically makes red meat probably more appropriate as a traditionally feminine food than society would have you believe. You'll see statements like men are more likely to be dehydrated than women, but it's useful to look at the reasons behind that. It's supposedly due to how much men sweat. As someone with hyperhidrosis, it would be potentially dangerous for me to measure myself against the hydration needs of other women, thinking that this surface level statement about men and women was universally applicable. Importantly, even with these on average calorie recommendations differing, there isn't really a justification for universal and obsessive restriction from mothers and daughters in families. The experts aren't recommending replacing meals with almonds, because on average male and female diets might have some differences, especially because the split of micronutrients like protein and carbohydrates is recommended to stay the same for everyone by these sources. If we look back in history, we can see the rise in this intense gendering of foods and social attitudes is relatively recent. In America, we can see these differences develop and emerge through attitudes in cookbooks in the 1800s onwards. Before the 1860s, cookbooks tended to make no difference between food for men and women, but a shift appears in that decade, with particular foods being identified as socially suitable for ladies' lunches or gentlemen's suppers. When we get to the 1900s, the messaging goes further to emphasize pleasing a man as the goal of the cookbook owner, now assumed to be housewives. In Women in Restaurants in the 19th century United States, historian Paul Friedman writes about the unique gendered food spaces of the time. The population migration and new configuration of towns and cities saw women shopping outside of their immediate neighborhood, often for the first time. The rise of these prolonged trips out of the home meant women were newly in need of meals out where before they might have returned home to eat. This led to a rise in women-focused restaurants known as ladies' ordinaries, where women could eat together in a socially acceptable way. Prior to this, women in eating establishments might have been seen as women of ill repute because men were the primary customers. Men could dine at ladies' ordinaries, but normally only when accompanied by a woman. Menus from these restaurants, however, showed no real difference to the food served at typical taverns at the time. Women were offered mutton, kidney, pies, hearty fare that didn't slip into the trap of dainty food for feminine sensibilities. However, by the mid-1900s, a new type of establishment emerged which absolutely capitalized on this gender division ice cream saloons. These focused on light bites, tea, and of course, ice cream. As the New York Times observed in 1890, the proprietors of the downtown restaurants have come to regard their female patrons as an important element, and special pains are taken in many places to cater to the fair lunches. While women are not all light eaters, most of them are partial to dainty tidbits, pastry and ice cream. Where a man would order a place of roast beef or spring lamb with peas, a woman would ask for a patty of some kind or the wing of a fowl. Oh, hello, going to the chicken shop for a, for a box of wing of the fowl. It only took a few decades for this supposedly obvious and near universal gendered idea of food to be accepted in the mainstream. A few decades after that, the differences would even more stark. As Friedman explains, in the 1920s, and especially in the next two decades, a whole genre of cookbooks proliferated that were addressed to men or designed to tell women what men like. These contrast the hearty male appetite for spicy, sharp, but simple foods like chili, steak au pois, or corned beef hash with women's inclination towards frilly salads, gelatin, or whipped cream. It's easy to see the idea of foods being sweet and decadent, but also light and slimming as potentially incompatible, but they can be seen as representations of the ideals for women themselves. They must be sweet, but sensual, indulgent, but slim, small, and accommodating. And we see this change over time in the way the ideal woman is portrayed, especially in the ways intersex with class. The bodies and foods play into aspirational imagery in a very real way, particularly because food is so universal, it potentially feels like an aspiration that is ever within grasp. Ideal body types are often dictated by the resources of the upper classes. High status women in Europe in past centuries had access to leisure time and financial resources to gain weight. And so we see portraits and statues of fat women held up as high status desirable beauties. In a world where childbirth was often deadly and motherhood was a woman's core responsibility, wide hips, large breasts, and a 
weight that spoke of abundance and wealth was desirable. If we look at the landscape now, rich women have the money and time to be able to afford personal trainers and nutritionists and private chefs to prepare food for them. They don't live in food deserts where access to fresh food is limited. They have free time to exercise and the resources for plastic surgery. A thin body with just the right amount of curves and toning from targeted exercise and procedures, not strength born of manual labor, is the new ideal. Researcher Emily Contois talks about the ways that values and attitudes to class and gender and race and more are intrinsically linked to our ideas of food. The middle class, particularly in the US, venerates health as a deeply moralized super value. Health becomes something to be enthusiastically pursued as part of performing, sustaining and protecting one's class status and distinction. At the same time, healthier food is often more expensive in terms of actual cost or with respect to the extra time, skill and energy to procure and prepare in our current food system. The cultural politics of health and eating right demand that good eaters not just follow dietary advice, but embody it. To not just be someone who eats kale, but someone who likes it and wants it. Along with gender and race, these class-based distinctions are part of how and why ideas about health can become so quickly commodified and remain culturally entrenched. Ideas of certain foods and ideal bodies being split down gendered lines might have been tied up with social ideas of gender in the past. But with growing gender equality across the world, what is keeping these ideals so polarised for so many? The main course, marketing food. We see this idea that there are certain kinds of food for men or women across the advertising industry, from how adverts target their products towards a certain gender, to the invention of specific products for each gender, to the start of dieting programs targeted at women, and in recent years, at men too. Some iconic examples of gendered food products are things like the Yorkie chocolate bar in the UK, which has been targeted towards men ever since its creation. In 1976, a marketer at Roundtree spotted a gap in the confectionery market for a manly chocolate bar, and so the company launched Yorkie as a competitor to Cadbury's Dairy Milk. Its early ads featured truckers positioning the bar as fuel for vigorous men doing tough work. In 2002, the bar was relaunched with a campaign making its masculine association even more explicit with the tagline, it's not for girls, and a no women symbol in place of the O in the logo. Other slogans included don't feed the birds, not available in pink, and king size, not queen size. It was one of those things that was just part of the gender war background noise of the 2000s for me, but when I think about it for like two seconds, it is seriously weird. The it's not for girls line and no woman sign were removed from the packaging in 2012, perhaps later than many would have expected, but was instead replaced with the only slightly less cringy slogan, man fuel for man stuff. That actually might be more cringe. Similarly, the Mars company launched a campaign for their Snickers bar in 2011, which featured Mr. T arriving on the scene to scold men for acting unmasculine before telling them to eat a Snickers and get some nuts. Another campaign featured a range of other celebrities but played into similar stereotypes around gender, as with the ad where Joan Collins appears in a men's locker room arguing with two men before another comes in and tells her, Dan, eat a Snickers because you turn into a right diva when you're hungry. Collins then morphs back into the average dude before the two taglines play one after another. You're not new when you're hungry, Snickers get some nuts. Certain foods are constructed as masculine, not just because of advertising, but because of cultural stereotypes around masculinity, virility and aggression. The most obvious, of course, being meat. In The Sexual Politics of Meat, Carol J. Adams writes that, women may eat plants since each is placid, but active men need animal meat. Plant-based foods are heavily associated with women, particularly salads as seen in the emergence of the stock photo category, women laughing alone with a salad. These stock images are women, usually thin, usually white or light skinned, smiling or laughing while holding a bowl of salad, often with a fork, poised, ready to eat. These images are so prolific that they've become a meme. What do these women find so funny about the salad? We simply may never know. Deep dive coming soon to a video essay channel near you, I'm sure. Rabbit food or diet food has become very closely associated with womanhood and rejecting it is a mark of masculinity. The Super Bowl, a sporting event, which is obviously heavily masculine coded, is also a food heavy event. And the kinds of food that are supposed to be consumed during the Super Bowl, even that are allowed, are heavily masculinized. Even though in reality, the most consumed food at Super Bowl parties is often vegetables. This is visualized in the 2014 by Chevrolet, in which a truck with a massive barbecue and toad pulls up at a tailgate party and the voiceover recites an ode to simple straightforward masculinity a man a man and his truck and tofu and veggie burgers and raw kale salads be damned 
The ad shows people enjoying a prolific amount of meat prepared by the truck driving grill master, who at one point shows off his raw meat to another man, holding it like a baby in a parody of masculine pride and achievement. There's a class element to this too. These articles and ads define football food in terms of masculine satisfying meals rather than feminine healthy produce, but they also express resistance against foods which are too posh for football, like fancy cheese or tapenade, which was the punchline of a 2012 DirecTV NFL commercial. We also see this gendering even in advertisements for meat-free products, as brands try to appeal to men by making them feel comfortable using the same coding as meat product advertising. Both Burger King and Carl's Jr., for example, advertise their meat-free burgers by referencing cowboys, the American West, agricultural life, and enduring traits of masculinity. And both don't actually refer to their burgers as vegetarian or vegan at any point, both opting for the phrase made from plants instead, and emphasizing that their burgers still taste the same as traditional meat. The Carl's Jr. spokesperson described describing their burger as juicy, charbroiled, and with the same legendary flavor as their meat burgers. The marketing term gender contamination goes some way to explaining this, especially when it comes to food. Gender contamination is an anxiety around our identities and a fear of engaging with products that we perceive as being from the wrong gender. This is particularly noticeable when men are consumers. While many women will buy products that are advertised to men, men are much less likely to buy products that are seen as feminine. In the same way, women will consume male-centric media, but men apparently won't watch films or read books with female protagonists. Food is a particularly fraught arena for gender contamination anxiety to take hold, as it's something that we actually consume. It has the power, or so we're told by adverts, to actually change our bodies. Men's fears around food often go beyond social concerns around being considered feminine and extend to actually becoming more feminine, whether that's in contemporary anxieties with soy and estrogen, or the fact that in the 1990s, Luna Bar was regularly contacted by men who were concerned that eating the company's nutrition bars would make them grow breasts and turn them into women. Trans girl life hack. <laughs> right there. In an attempt to counteract these anxieties, brands have focused on creating new products for men to assuage any fears about, for example, yogurt being a woman's food. In 2013, the company Powerful Men, now renamed to Powerful Foods, launched a yogurt for men, Powerful Yogurt, which came in a black cup with bull's horns on the front and six pack shaped ridges on the sides, a reference to their tagline, find your inner abs. Yogurt packaging in the West, and particularly in America, where yogurt is less of a dietary staple than in Europe, South Asia, Russia, and the Middle East, least, is typically white or pastel coloured, with the labels that highlight low or no fat content and advertise probiotics and gut health. The 1980s onwards, yogurt has been gendered as a feminine food in the American market, with products aimed at women and children. Ad campaigns showed women eating yogurts in place of more calorific desserts, essentially a more virtuous alternative to a cheesecake that allowed women to be indulgent. Many yogurt ads from brands like Activia didn't even bother to show a woman's full body. They just showed a bare, light skin, flat stomach that food academic Amy Vidali viscerally describes as gastrointestinal pornography, that is ads which partition and objectify women's bodies and eroticize healthy eating. Powerful yogurt was pitched as the first yogurt for men, and the CEO said that in the yogurt industry, everyone is talking to women in their digestive health. And Powerful yogurt took a different approach and emphasized the protein content, a more manly macronutrient, while female-focused ads focus on low-fat content and low calories. Unlike yogurt for women, which was pitched as a health food or a healthy substitute to indulgent desserts, man yogurt was presented as a protein-heavy snack to help build muscle and strength. In a powerful yogurt ad from 2013, the year the product launched, a woman is alone in the forest, unable to light a fire for some reason. Maybe her womanly hands are too delicate to light the single match that she brought with her. Suddenly, a man with an open shirt showing off his toned abs, holding a massive log over his shoulder appears. He strikes a random rock not flint, incidentally, on his abs and starts a fire. And the woman's blouse promptly pops open in response. Roll the tagline, we all have abs somewhere, find them. And then we're told that the yogurt contains 25 grams of protein in every man-sized package, emphasis on man, unfortunately, theirs. Other brands also tried launching man yogurt products around the same time. Pro-Yo, a high-protein frozen yogurt, also launched in 2013, and Danone's Triple Zero came out in 2015. Both of these also came in black packaging, relied on athletic branding, and tried to appeal to men by emphasizing the protein content, coding them as masculine alternatives to traditionally feminine yogurts. We see something similar in diet drinks, 
which are traditionally marketed and consumed by women. The first diet soft drink in the US, NoCal, was actually originally developed in the early 50s as an option for diabetic consumers. But as more and more people began to diet, the marketing shifted focus and it became a part of the soft drink market. In 1958, when Royal Crown Soda released their first diet drink, Diet Right, diet options comprised less than 1% of all American soft drink sales. But within 18 months, Diet Right was number four soft drink in the country, motivating competitors to develop their own. Coca-Cola launched its first diet soft drink, Tab, in 1963, the same year as Pepsi's Patio, which was renamed Diet Pepsi in 1964. While Diet Right marketed to women and children, Pepsi and Coca-Cola both focus at advertising on women. Patio is fronted by a TV fitness personality, Debbie Drake, who told women that Patio was great for your waist, while Tab ads encourage women to stay in his mind with a shape he can't forget. 20 years on, Coca-Cola decided to try and target men as well as women with a new unisex product, Diet Coke. They marketed it as a drink that was incidentally low calorie, with ads declaring, you're gonna drink it just for the taste of it, hoping that men wouldn't associate it with feminine of tab. By the end of 1983, Diet Coke was America's best-selling diet soft drink, but it still wasn't popular with men, with one unidentified Coca-Cola exec suggesting that this was because of the word diet in the name, claiming that diet is a four-letter word for men. In the early 90s, Coca-Cola tried again, creating a new sweetener to use in a diet soft drink for men. They theorized that men demanded full and satisfying flavor, while women are used to the unfulfilling and sometimes unpleasant aftertaste common to diet drinks after decades of consumption. Their sweetener, which mimics the mouth feel of sugar as well as the taste, they called Ace K and used it to create the new manly drink, Coke Zero. You can see the split in these products advertising mirrored by Diet Pepsi and Pepsi Max. The diet versions adverts focus on women and weight loss, whereas the Max and Zero ads are often more focused even now on men and power, with the exceptions to the rule playing on that difference, like the literal girl power Pepsi ads of the 2000s. One of the most notorious examples of an ad campaign which uses dieting and weight loss to encode its product as feminine is Special K. First airing in 2003, the Special K challenge promised women that they could lose six pounds in two weeks just by replacing two meals a day with Special K a bowl of cereal, and having a sensible dinner at night. The Special K, when it was first introduced in the UK in 1956, wasn't originally promoted as a diet food. In fact, it was designed as a high-protein breakfast cereal aimed at men. Feeding into and encouraging gendered body insecurities is a powerful marketing tool. Healthy and diet products, as we've seen, are often coded as feminine, and food for men is often aggressively masculinized, packed with protein, bursting with flavor. And so what about men who want to lose weight? Well, in terms of the weight loss marketing, it's also heavily gendered, reinforcing gender roles and perpetuating codes of gender behavior, as men are encouraged to continue living their lives while women-focused content promotes restriction and deprivation. Dieting began to be promoted more heavily in the UK to women in the 1950s towards the end of post-war rationing. Women were advised by magazines to trim their figure because the food available under rationing tended towards high starch foods. Women were warned to avoid eating too much of it with articles in magazines like Women's Own telling them to cut down on bread and potatoes. Writer Miriam Wilkes Haig, surveying the history of modern slimming culture, writes that The end of food rationing marked the beginning of a modern slimming culture, which has since permeated all aspects of women's lives. Early slimming advice to women focused on diets. Between 1966 and 1970, Women's Own recommended 40 different diets, including the banana and milk diet, the buttermilk diet, and the 350 air hostess diet, a diet of just 350 calories a day. Men began to be included in weight loss articles appearing in women's own in the 1960s but were a rare addition. The focus was very different. As Wilkes Haig writes, male slenderness was depicted as vital for a man's health and portrayed as an outward sign of his financial success and sexual prowess. A woman's journey to a slim body was usually described as being hampered by her uncontrollable food cravings and moods, as governed by the stages of her reproductive life cycle. Throughout the rest of the 20th century, men continued to be an outlier in women's slimming spaces. Perhaps the most famous diet program Weight Watchers was incorporated in 1963 and although it wasn't specifically aimed towards women, there were only ever a handful of men present at these meetings. And so in 2007, they launched a plan customized just for guys called Weight Watchers Online for Men. Early ads for this program promised that men could eat real food and achieve real weight loss with a customized online system built just for them. Again, there's a suggestion that traditional diet food that is associated with women isn't real food. 
Women will put up with this, they suggest, but real men need real food. Researcher Emily Contois has written extensively on the gendering of food in diet programs and published a side-by-side -side comparison of Weight Watchers Does It Work videos, 90 Second Explainers, which are available for both the original Weight Watchers Online program and the Weight Watchers Online for men. In these videos, Weight Watchers presents masculine dieting as fundamentally different to feminine dieting. As these videos show weight loss in completely different terms for men and women. In the original program video, a woman named Bonnie shows us how how the Weight Watchers app works, while the For Men video features a man named Dan, as Contois describes, while Bonnie uses program cheat sheets to dine out at a restaurant and make healthy choices, Dan eats out at a stereotypically masculine location, a sports bar, filled with round high top tables, backless stools and flat screen TVs, and orders tacos and pizza. The videos also depict Bonnie shopping for and preparing healthy foods in traditionally domestic spaces like the supermarket and kitchen, while Dan is shown on the go at a convenience store, buying chips and grilling his favourite food, steak, outdoors. The videos also show a completely different way of engaging with the plans. Bonnie sits at a desk using a computer and tends to be working through the program, whereas Dan says the tools are kind of like a video game, reassuring men that weight loss can be fun and they don't have to work hard to succeed at it. She concludes, Weight Watchers portrays female dieters on a difficult but actualizing an empowering journey towards a new and better self. Conversely, Weight Watchers depicts male clients losing weight easily, even effortlessly, but retaining a stable and immutable masculine selfhood throughout the process. The Lose Like a Man ad campaign was fronted by Charles Barkley, a former NBA player, a real man who again reassures men that dieting doesn't have to be feminine. In the ads, he appears dressed in black against a black backdrop and reassures men that on Weight Watchers, he can still eat wings, pizza, meatballs, and burgers, because Weight Watchers will teach you how to eat your favorite foods and still lose weight. There's even one ad where he appears in drag and tells the viewer, I hear so many guys think weight loss is just for women before reassuring us that I can still eat man food like steak and pizza. And this is the real problem, right? We might feel like ads like this are so obviously ridiculous that we're much too sophisticated to fall for the stereotypes they're selling, but unfortunately that's just not true across the board. The way that food is marketed to us, and that includes subliminal messaging around foods from weight loss ads, it's really impactful on both adults and worryingly on children. The World Health Organization earlier this year reported that food marketing remains a threat to public health and continues to negatively affect children's food choices, intended choices, and their dietary intake. It also negatively influences the development of children's norms about food consumption. In particular, multiple studies have found that food marketing impacts children's understandings of gender, both in terms of food and more widely. One study found that children were more likely to choose food and packaging consistent with their assigned gender, even when they would prefer the flavor of a snack that was in packaging associated with the other binary gender instead. Children also so consistently sorted pink foods as girl foods and blue foods as boy foods. And a subset of children who imposed gender onto other foods like hamburgers being boy foods did this consistently too. Multiple studies have found that elementary age girls are more likely to choose fruits and vegetables than boys are, and that boys are not only more likely to choose and prefer meat, but that boys age five to 10 overtly associate meat with masculinity. In the 1990s, researchers from Harvard studied how the introduction of TV affected the body image attitudes of teen girls in Fiji. At the the point when access to Western satellite TV shows like Beverly Hills 90210 started in 1995, they surveyed a group of girls and found that the traditional local attitude of round and fat bodies being attractive was common. Rates of eating disorders were fairly low and just 3% of the girls said they had ever vomited to control their weight. In fact, there was just a single reported case of anorexia nervosa. Just three years later in 1998, however, they returned and found that at that point, 15% of the girls surveyed had vomited to control their weight. They specifically found a correlation between the amount of TV the children watched and the likelihood that they had negative feelings towards their bodies. Girls who said in 1998 that they watched TV three or more nights a week were 50% more likely to describe themselves as too big or fat, even though the girls' average weight hadn't changed. 69% of girls reported dieting to lose weight and those whose families owned televisions were three times more likely to experience disordered eating. But it's not just body image that suffers thanks to advertising and media. The ways in which food and dieting are presented in our culture certainly influence our perception of our own bodies and our the people's bodies, but they also lead to us internalizing those ideas about gender and food. What kinds of foods are feminine and masculine? What foods are and aren't permissible to us because of our gender? What actions we should be taking to lose weight and control our bodies? The dessert, creating food. Thanksgiving just passed and Christmas is coming up, two family celebrations centered around food, with traditional images of women working in the kitchen to prepare a veritable feast, then the man of the house sits at the head of the table and carves the roast. 
I asked about this on my Patreon and the replies were all much along the same lines. People talking about this gender divide in the household of girl cousins washing up after dinner while the boy cousins went to watch sports on TV. The food preparation is only part of the labor that goes into these celebrations. There's the planning, the hosting, the kin keeping, the cleaning and decorating, tasks that are also often falling to women as an expectation. This idea of women being responsible for cooking in the home is not just over the holidays. As shown in the results of a 2022 survey by Gallup and Cookpad, which tracked how often people prepare and eat home-cooked meals in countries around the globe. They found that on average, women cooked just under nine meals per week, compared to men who cooked about four. Only one country, Italy, had men cooking more on average than women. When asked about why this is, interesting comments emerged. NPR spoke to a professional chef, Mike Friedman, who operates several restaurants in the Washington DC area, and he said, I think women can handle more on their plate. This unloading of work disguised as a compliment is familiar to many of us, a compliment that is often hiding the truth, with a 2019 YouGov poll finding that 51% of women said that Christmas was stressful compared with 35% of men. This a social expectation on women, particularly those in heterosexual relationships, to manage and complete domestic tasks. The phrase weaponized incompetence has risen in mainstream popularity in the last few years to reflect the ways that some men in particular take advantage of this expectation. Originally, it was used to describe people who faked a level of incompetence competence to shift some wanted tasks elsewhere in the corporate world, but now it's much more likely to be used to refer to men who pretend to be bad at household and childcare tasks so that women of the house will take over. The idea is that they will do it so badly and make such a mess and take so long that it feels like less stress for the woman to just do it herself in the moment. Except it's not just one time where they take it as an opportunity to learn and take it on next time. It's an ongoing pattern that leads to them getting off the hook to do the task at all. As writer Ashley Ostrew writes, you've likely seen posts demonstrating weaponized incompetence on social media. A wife makes a grocery list with pictures because her husband can't find his way around the store. A woman surveys her wrecked house after her husband watches their toddler. A mum asks her spouse to put away leftovers only to find later that he's lazily shoved an entire crock pot into the refrigerator. The added stress this causes is not just the additional labor added to the woman's plate, but also the stress of feeling unable to rely on her partner. Although there are men who do this deliberately, knowing it will get them out of a task if they don't want to do it, a lot of others, I think, are unconsciously buying into the social myth that women are just naturally better at housework and chores and childcare. The sense that it comes easier for her, that she just knows this stuff, rather than the fact that she looked it up herself, like he could do, or was even pushed into it at a young age because of those very myths. And we see the true hypocrisy of these myths when we compare the idea that women belong in the kitchen with the overwhelming prevalence of male professional chefs. It highlights this expectation that women are supposedly able to cook by default, whereas if men do it, they have some special ability or skill or masculine interest which is elevated. The latest national data I could find from the UK was from the 2018 Office of National Statistics study, which showed that only 17% of chef positions in the UK are held by women. Current enrollment rates into culinary school in the US is nearly 50-50 between men and women. However, this has only been the case very recently, with the gap closing from a 10 to 90 split in favor of men just a few decades ago. Inevitably, the current state of gender inequality in the industry is affected by this split in training. We'd expect to see a rise in women in professional kitchens as the current students graduate into work. However, the fact the split itself even existed in the first place, especially when running parallel to a time in society when women were expected to be in charge of family meals to an even greater extent than now, cannot be overlooked. The traditional environment of a working kitchen itself is a clear potential factor. In terms of Western professional kitchens, the workflow and structure dates back to the pioneering work of Auguste Escoffier in the 1800s, who conceived of the brigade style structure. Most kitchens still use this today. It was directly inspired by the military at the time with an all male strict hierarchy based system. Many historians point to it as an effort to distance restaurant cooking from the home cooking of the woman's realm. In 2017, the Washington Post released a wide reaching investigation into the the epidemic of abuse suffered by women working in such professional kitchens. They concluded, from lewd comments to rape, sexual misconduct is, for many, simply part of the job. The report included the brigade style environment as a method of perpetuating and excusing this behavior. This accepted style of boys club kitchen then creates a hostility to bringing in more women to the restaurant, or even men who might want to create a more welcoming environment. In 2021, a survey from the UC Berkeley Food and Labor Research Center found that 71% of women who worked in restaurant environments have been sexually harassed at least once during their time in the industry. The key stereotypical image of the chef on screen perpetuated by the performative personalities of celebrity chefs like Gordon Ramsay is not not a fictional myth. As food journalist Megan McCorran puts it, the chefs anointed as cultural arbiters were almost always white, almost always male. They shouted, they swaggered, they got sued for sexual harassment. 
They get away with it because they're considered as an essential kind of professional artist. They seek excellence, perfection, fresh new ideas and innovative techniques. They're praised for the science of molecular gastronomy or the dedication of old traditions. They are technical and precise. They are not mothers and wives at home over the hearth, cooking with maternal care and sweetness and nurturing instincts. Male chefs sometimes talk about the inspiration they get from mothers or aunts or grandmas in the kitchen, but in interviews it's often framed as something cute and sweet that is then surpassed by the man himself, that it was his input and changes that elevated it to something noteworthy at all. Food journalist Megan McCorrin talked about this extensively in an article, An Eater. Two dueling short profiles of Nadine Levy Redzepi in The Guardian and Bloomberg, both written by men, emphasise the simple, homey nature of her cooking and the supposed challenge of cooking for the best chef in the world, contrasting her baked salmon with the exotified live ants deployed by her famous chef husband, René. Meanwhile, when René Redzepi released a personal collection of cookbooks, his insights about home cooking and family traditions were received as instructions from an impeachable expert. The cognitive dissonance is staggering. A world which acknowledges the default role of women in the kitchen at home, apparently naturally suited to cooking and food prep, yet when it comes to officially and professionally being recognised for it, they can't cut it. An article from Vice back in 2017 made for fascinating reading during my research for this video. They interviewed Dutch professional chefs on why they thought there was such a lack of women in professional kitchens in the country. One, Dennis Trappenberg, a chief cook in Rotterdam, said this. It's hard to explain. I think it's mainly because we work long hours, 10 to 12 hours a day. Men can continue a little longer than women. Now already, I'd question the evidence for this, especially when we see that even in households where men and women work the same hours at paid jobs, women still overwhelmingly take household labour on on top of that, which seems to be evidence against his assertion. But then, indeed, he continues, seemingly realising that what he's saying simply isn't true in his own kitchen. Damn, when I say this, it sounds very crazy, because I've worked in the kitchen with enough women and none of them have had any problems with those days. They're real go-getters. Anyway, overall, it's still more of a male thing to have the strength to work long hours, isn't it? Within two or three sentences, he admits that he's saying things out of thin air based on evidenceless bias, but then sticks to that theory. And even as this assertion of incorrect, it seems to be a problem with work hours, not with actual skills involving cooking. Punishing work hours within a hyper-masculine capitalist-driven workplace are often a matter of pride rather than being seen as a problem that affects the lives, mental and physical health of employees. It does everyone a disservice. Interestingly, there is a professional area of food which has consistently been the domain of women, and that is baking. In the 2018 paper, The Feminization of Baking and Pastry Work, Dissecting Gender Roles in the Food Service Industry, researcher Alexis Modes noted that inequalities still plague the field, however. Star Chef's 2005 salary report confirms that women make up 80% of bakers, 77% of pastry chefs, and 84% of pastry cook positions. While women hold a majority of positions in baking and pastry, the 2010 Star Chef salary report reveals they are still paid 27% less than male pastry chefs. And this is particularly telling to me. It's not that women in the restaurant industry are uniquely affected, it's that the industry is a microcosmic example of patterns across nearly all industries, where we see rampant workplace sexual harassment, a higher percentage of women in an occupation lowering pay grades, or men in higher positions of power, the list goes on. It's just that this feels particularly egregious because it's an industry based on the space where women have been forced to participate in for no monetary rewards for centuries in their own homes. But how has this idea of women belonging in the kitchen endured for so long? I think a key social movement to look at as an example is the Victorian imagery of the separate gendered spheres of influence. The idea that men belonged out in the world and women belonged in the home. This was exemplified in the most distilled way by the image of the angel in the house, a glorified ideal for women to live up to. An existence that resolved around devotion of submission to your husband, an angelic, gentle, devoted presence focused on home life. The phrase itself originated from a famous Coventry Patmore poem, which talked about his wife as the perfect example of this ideal. Man must be pleased, but him to please is woman's pleasure. Down the gulf of his condoled necessity, she casts her best, she flings herself. Now, this idea of men working and women keeping the house wasn't new, but it had a renewed fervour around the mid-1800s. Why, you ask? Why? The rise of women's rights, of course. The Divorce and Matrimony Clauses Act of 1858, for example, meant that the courts could decide on divorce proceedings in the UK rather than it being a parliament act individually for every case, which meant more women could afford to do it. Decades later, we saw a surge in the women's suffrage movement begin and the emphasis on women belonging at home, serving a husband rather than concerning herself with the world outside and politics and work and society more widely was a clear response to these social changes. And these changes continue to affect women's relationships 
relationship with food in the 20th century, women taking on the labor of the workforce in the Second World War and the rise of new household technology from the Industrial Revolution onwards meant less time needed to be spent in laundry, cleaning and indeed cooking through tech like vacuums, frozen food and pre-prepared meals. At the start of the 1900s, just 5% of married women worked, but by 2000, that was up to over 60%. At the start of the 1900s, the average married employed woman spent 27 hours a week on household chores. In 2019, the average married employed woman spent 21 hours. So a century of change and new technology and gender equality, and it's nearly the same. Cool. According to that research from the Bureau of Labour and Statistics, indeed, on an average day, just 20% of men did any housework at all, compared with 49% of women. Women also spent more time on cooking and clean up than men, 69% and 46% respectively. And this holds outside the US and UK too. One area of study that I found particularly interesting was actually Australian barbecue culture. There's this piece of research funded by an Aussie company that makes outdoor grills, Beef Eater, to see usage attitudes across the country. They surveyed a thousand people and found that outdoor cooking was much preferred to indoor cooking by Australians. And sure, that seems like a nice stat for a company selling outdoor cooking gear, right? But the study also revealed this deep gender difference. 71% of women still saw grilling outside as a more masculine way of cooking. 33% of them said they liked being in charge of the barbecue, but only 11% said that they were the ones who operated it in their household. 63% of women said they'd had resistance from men or even been actively ushered away when trying to operate the grill outdoors, with 42% saying that their partner underestimated their barbecuing knowledge and skill. Their partner, not some arsehole colleague or random passerby, their partner. The most frustrating stats were in the way the roles at the barbecue gathering were perceived. The results revealed the only task clearly handled by the men was cooking the meat, while the respondents indicated that 81% of women invited the guests, 79% did the shopping, 71% hosted the guests, 93% prepared salads and sides, and 65% did the cleaning up. Despite the apparent disparity in workload, 44% of the female participants said their partner usually received all of the recognition. The final course. The Almond Mum is not an isolated quirk of a particular time in recent history. It is just the latest phrase to describe a behaviour, a pressure and expectation that has been around for much longer than that, of women especially to adhere to a specific body type, to guide their daughters towards that same end, to ensure their social success as much as for reasons of health. Food and its preparation has long been the duty of women, but so often they are punished by it, not rewarded for engaging with it, because the kitchen work is a foregone expectation. The image of Barbie cooking but not eating feels so apt, it's almost too on the nose. For so many women, our autonomy and agency in the world of food is cut off at every turn. Instead, it is guilt and dieting while men take the glory of real cooking for money and accolades. Almost every cultural message around women and food feeds into this idea of a lack of agency over food. Food as an act of service for women. Food being something that makes them desirable through either weight loss or wife skills. But I hope that this self-awareness we see in the comments on Arm and Mom TikToks of millennial women acknowledging this toxic cycle and working to break it, just discussing ways to avoid passing on the same anxieties to their children will amount to change. That the increases in gender equality in culinary schools will start to shift the environment of professional kitchens. The opportunities will flow more readily to women looking to make a mark on the food world for something other than another diet fad. Because food can be wonderful and healing and loving and exciting and joyous if you're able to fight past the special K and almonds to get there. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to help support the channel and the videos that I make, then please consider becoming a patron over on Patreon. The link is in the description. And a new thing I've just added is I'm gonna be doing extra videos for patrons where I talk about things that were sort of cut for time or extra research and my methods and behind the scenes and all sorts around each of the videos that I make each month. So go and check it out if you are so inclined. Also, I'd love to hear what you think. So if you have any thoughts on the topic of today's video, any experiences you wanna share, then please leave them in the comments below. I'm also going to leave all my social media links in the description so you can find me all over the internet and a final thank you to book of the month for sponsoring this video until i see you next time bye i don't even like almonds almonds